Hello there, sword friends. Today I have something sword adjacent for you. It is a sword on a stick or a 15th century glaive from Arms and Armor. And before I get into the review, a couple quick disclaimers. One, this is a temporary sample I get to play with. The folks at Arms and Armor lent it to me for the weekend, so I have less time to spend with this than I typically do. Most of the time I get to keep samples, and most of the time I get to have them for months and months and months or do the review at my leisure. But in this case, it's only fresh in my mind right now, and I haven't gotten to spend a lot of time with it. So you should know that I didn't spend any money on it. If you think that makes me biased, I guess you know the start. I do have to give it back in this case, and I also haven't spent much time with it, which is something I've reiterated several times now. Uh, you should also note that I don't know what the hell I'm doing with it. I don't study any kind of historic European martial arts, but I do study a style of Japanese swordsmanship, which involves naginata, and this is not entirely dissimilar to it. So if you see me moving it around with some level of competence, that's probably why, though, it likely doesn't mirror anything that you would find in a history book for a historical glaive. Uh, anyway, Keep that in mind as you hear my babbles throughout the course of this video. Uh, the other bit you should know is that this is $1,375, which is a relatively substantial amount of money, I think, for a sword on a stick. Uh, but this has some intricacy to it and is also an underrepresented category of weapons. I don't know if I if I know of any other glaive like this on the market. Perhaps there are. If there, if there are and you know it, throw it in the commentary down below. But uh, this one is special. Hopefully I can el elaborate on why that is and give you some idea of if it's worth your money. And so structure for the video will be I will show you up close looks of the bits and bobs and fits and features. I'll move it around such as I am able to and talk about handling it. I'll cut with it in a little bit. I, I'm not going to abuse it in any way because I do have to return it to Arms and Armor so they can sell it or bring it to a convention. I'm not sure what they're going to do with it. Uh, anyway, then I'll give you my thoughts on if it's worth it or not. But hopefully at that point, you've had enough information to make up your own mind. Anyway, on with the with the thing that I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to start with the end cap here. I don't know if it's a pommel, if that's the right term, but this little butt cap at the end. So it's about five inches in totality, but it has a three inch spike at the end. And that is a very, very effective spike. I whacked water bottles with it. I thrust it into my stand. I used it to kind of push stuff away and it is very effective. The end of the spike is also flat. So if you need to set it on the ground, it doesn't poke through your wood floors or anything like that, but I wouldn't set it on a wood floor. It doesn't um, damage your concrete though, at least. You can set it on the ground without damaging the spike as well uh, because it's flattened on that end, but it, it is very effective at moving stuff away. If you wanted to punch a hole in something, if you wanted to push somebody away, if you wanted to uh, maybe grab a shield with it, punch through it and try to manipulate it or move it around so you could come in with an attack at the other end of the glaive, then the the spike is very effective for that. And the whole apparatus seems relatively robust and, and well-made. I did whack my six by six stand with it, hit it pretty hard. There was no bending on the spike. It seemed like it's very stable. It also has some ornamentation and depth to it. The shape is somewhat interesting. The um, the only complaint that I'd have is that the, the spike or the, the end cap itself is not recessed into the wood. It kind of covers over it like a, like a little hat at the end, and I'd like it if it were recessed. And I, I will note here that the folks at Arms and Armor seem to know how to recreate a, a, an item from history much better than I do. So perhaps that's an ahistoric ass, but it is harder to do and something I like to see on an item that is this expensive. Um, it does have some ornamentation on it. There's some grooves and stuff going on, but it's a relatively plain looking piece. That's not necessarily bad or a historic, but again, when I'm when I'm paying $1,375, which I know doesn't go as far as it used to, but uh, you know, some extra zazz is appreciated here. So recessed would be one thing, but also maybe some crispness on the, the or ornamentation would, would be a welcome thing here as well. Now, I don't know uh, if that is a bad idea from a historic standpoint, my experience is more in Japanese arms. Those can be very elaborate. I would imagine European arms can, can be the same, but I'm not as familiar with the end caps of pole arms. So uh, take that thought for, for what it's worth, because I, I believe they're probably trying to recreate something more historic, something that could be transported back in time and that, you know, a man at arms wouldn't necessarily, you know, bat an eyelash at and would fit right in in the time. So uh, anyway, I digress. It is handsome enough, and it also very, it's also very robust and effective, and I really enjoyed this. I know I'm talking a lot about this little spike at the end of the bit, um, but it was just a lot of fun to use and also very effective. There's uh, two ends to pole arms, and people often forget about the other end. There's seldom attached anything cool or interesting. It tends to just be bare wood, so seeing a spike here and one that's very effective and, and durable is also something I just I, I really like because it fits in with the style that I'm familiar with with pole arms. 
Moving up there though, I'm gonna talk about the shaft. So this is octagonal, I believe, in shape. I'm not sure, but it, it's a little bit of a rectangle with the edges chamfered down and it indexes exceptionally well. So I can feel right where the edge is. And as I compare it to some of the other pole arms that I happen to have in my collection that are round, they don't index well. That means I can't tell where the edge is exactly. Um, some of them move freely in my hand. So if I stick them in, you know, I really have to bear down on them to, to not have them roll in my hand. This doesn't move at all in my hand. A bad cut or something that would typically move it around in my hand and force me to readjust my grip didn't happen here. It stays rock solid in my hand and is also easy to move around. It's comfortable throughout. So there's some cuts that I'm doing, some move maneuvers that I'm doing that cause me to move my hands up and down throughout the shaft. And at no point is it uncomfortable or non-ergonomic it's all very smooth and overall well-made. And I mean, the lines are relatively consistent. Uh, the shape is consistent. It's not bent or wobbly. There's no kind of part that looks like they missed a step and, you know, leaned into the sander too much. All of it is, is very fine woodwork uh, and very ergonomic as well. I feel like I have a good connection with the weapon and I feel like it's not moving in my hand and that gives me a good sense of control over it, uh, which includes the section for the langets and the, the, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but these metal bars that are on the side of the sword uh, or of the of the glaive that are riveted or nailed in. I'm not sure if that piece goes all the way through or not, but I digress. There's a little, uh, what appear to be nails of some kind run into the rib, in, into the langets, these strips that go down, and those are recessed into the shaft and recessed very well. So important thing to call out here is as I m move my hands up and down the shaft, which you could take the wrong way, but uh, as I move my hands up and down the shaft, none of my hand is not snagging on any of the the nails rivets that are, are hammered down on any of the wood where it's the the langets are recessed in uh, i can very easily manipulate this in a glove or in a bare hand and it, i don't lose any skin nothing's happening there's no discomfort whatsoever I, i'm probably making this euphemism way worse but very comfortable shaft to move your hands up and down on okay uh, as i move up though there is this kind of odd little cross guard thing going on. And I don't know what the intent is, but I suspect it's not for battle. Perhaps there's some ornamentation that goes on it, but it's it's kind of oddly affixed. So this little cross guard area uh, cap bell thing doesn't doesn't attach to the socket. And you can see the area where it doesn't pass the socket and it's riveted down on either corner of the uh, of where this, you know, where the socket outline is. Uh, and then it's nailed in with these little braces that run into the into the shaft. But I, I feel like if I hit it really hard with an axe, a sword, a pole arm, a, uh, even if I punched it, that it would move or diminish in some way. Like it doesn't feel particularly strong. I, I don't have license to really abuse this one, so I didn't test that theory. But it kind of moves around and I can bang on it. It makes little clicky noises. But I don't think it's like a fidget clicker from the medieval period. I imagine it serves some purpose. That purpose seems like it would be to deflect um, swords or other arms from coming down the shaft and hitting your hands or maybe a stop for your hands going up. But I don't know why it's not attached to the shaft or is affixed the way it is. Uh, I digress, though. The little beams seem handmade i guess they don't they look like they're hammered out and and banged in they have kind of a rough look to them but at the same time i'm guessing that's because they're hand forged out uh and they also make these little spaces that feel like your fingers could get stuck in there i was wary of that i didn't find it to be the case as i choked up but i was cautious to not get my fingers up in there and twist it around uh but anyway it seems like an odd thing and it's going to have to remain a mystery what it is i imagine there's a very logical reason that it is the way that it is but I don't happen to know what that is. It just does not seem fit for war. That's at least at least my guess that it's not not for that. Um, or maybe it is. Maybe somebody would grab it and you're it, it's supposed to break away easily. I, I'm not sure exactly what what the intent is there. But um, it doesn't seem like it's made to deflect other weapons. That's that's at least a, I think what it's not for. And if it is, then I think it would be better if it were uh, affixed into the socket itself than loose. So that anyway, I digress. It's fit on the way it is. You can see it. It's neat. I'll have to ask them why it's made that way. Hi, Matt. Craig and Nathan here. And we wanted to answer your excellent question about the handguard on the glaive. Um, it is a piece of sheet steel that is uh, pierced so that the glaive can pass through there uh, from the bottom, of course and then small little feet that come down on either side of the corners when are riveted to the plate and pinned into the handle. 
This is a methodology that we see in a lot of pole weapons on how these kinds of rondelles are mounted. Uh, on some allspice and other styles where you can sometimes come down from the top, you'll see it slide down and then it'll be chisel hits on the corners that'll actually splay out the socket area to hold that rondelle in place. But they are almost always a separate piece. They're not connected to the socket. Um, you had some questions about using it uh, and how durable it would be. Uh, if Nathan and I were in combat here and I was using it out here, it, you can see it doesn't have a lot of catch for trying to use it as a guard in that sense. And uh, you know, to try and manipulate my opponent's weapon, it's pretty easy for him to displace around it. Um, this is almost certainly more of a hand protector. So I'm wearing uh, a gauntlet here for, for armor, so if we're both armored up and we're fighting here, I'm fighting more like I'm in the half sword with this type of weapon. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the, I'm getting double protection here. The rondelle is actually protecting any open area I might have around the interior of the thumb and finger there, so that when I'm thrusting, it's very well protected. So you're not going to get thrust into your palm. Yeah, so there's there's no point there, there's no purchase for a point to go in there. Yeah. In the context of being in a, in a fight like this, it does allow me to clear and use it in some way to use the weapon as a clearance with that hand, but it's probably much more just a protection for the hand and not designed to take heavy blows. Um, if, if, if we're here, yeah, I can, I can use it in that way, and I'm sure they would have, but you're not getting a lot of force against it. And if we're here and he's trying to hit that guard to knock it loose, it, it, it's pretty difficult for him to try and do that and hit it. It's, yeah. that's and if it pretty did get sense. sent, it yeah. wouldn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you just, it, this is the Duke's weapon. That's what we designed it as. This is a high-end glaive hardened steel, the thing's polished up, it's a sword on a stick of the same type that they would carry. You would choose it when you were fighting in battle or the lists, and so you didn't worry if this got bent or beat up, because you'd hand it to Alfred and he would take it and fix it. That was his job. Your you cup paid hurt. him to do yeah. that. So The other thing this is for is that a bunch of these fighting styles with these weapons involve a slide. Yeah. Right? So like, if I were here and like Craig thrust at me and I deflected him this way, my next cut would be coming down the side of that, right? So this offers some stoppage there for some of those cuts, but yeah, I think it's mainly to, if you look at that gauntlet when he's holding it like that, when you're fighting in armor, there are only a few places you can stab someone in the palm of their hand is one of the best spots. So if they're standing there with their hand out, but if this was a spear and I was standing here like this, stab me right there, right? Yeah. That's the forward target. So that this. covers the palm of the hand, yeah. which knights who are trained, right, are looking at another knight in armor. They're evaluating their armor. They're saying, all right, he's got mail here, and here, he doesn't have it probably in his groin, the yep. palm of his hand, the bottom of his feet. Or you check our blog post, yep. especially with the glaive. Yep. In the lower rear. Yep, or in the bottom. <laughs> what, what? Glaive time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bye, Matt. <laughs> Take care. which moves us up to the socket, which is about five inches. Those measurements, again, are in the, in the description down below. It has little brass uh, ornamentation around where I think a nail or a rivet, again, I don't know if this goes all the way through or if there are two nails set in to keep the socket from moving around. But one thing I should note is that the socket developed a very slight amount of wiggle after I used it on the tatami mats. I believe that's where it happened. It was rock solid when I got it. And afterward, if I shake the shaft vigorously, uh, there's euphemisms everywhere. 
uh, there's just a slight amount of wiggle and I don't know if it just needs to be banged down. It's not like I couldn't use the weapon anymore, but it does just have the, the slightest bit of wiggle. And I don't know if the wood needs to penetrate into the socket a little bit more, if the socket could be a little bit bigger. I'm not sure what could be done to, to stabilize that and prevent it from from happening because happening on tatami is some degree of concerning though it's not a substantial amount i'm, I'm really being kind of kind of picky about it but again it's a 1375 dollar sword on a stick so you'd want it to be robust and uh I, I believe it certainly is but in this case it had the faintest bit of wiggle in the socket uh, and only one direction as well, just front to back, which is the way, direction I was swinging when I hit the tatami. At least I think I was, so I'm guessing that's that's where it happened and why it happened. Uh, as I move up to the blade, though, it's got a diamond cross section in a, in a shape which is somewhat unique. I, I know you can go buy a spear from, like, Cold Steel and buy a pole to stick in your closet from Home Depot and marry the two and get yourself a cheaper spear. Uh, this, though, has a, a different shape than I'm accustomed to seeing on the market. And if I'm wrong, let me know where you can buy something like this. But I, as far as I'm aware, this is somewhat unique. It has, um, one, a very thick blade, relatively little distal taper. There's some, but it kind of comes in towards the the top couple inches of the blade. It also has a back edge that is shorter than the front edge in these little choil sections, which again, I would imagine serves some purpose, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. I don't know why it's shaped like this, but I do know that it looks pretty cool. In terms of the edge, it was not super sharp. It has a pretty robust edge, which I'd imagine if you're fighting people in armor or chainmail or some sort of very thick gambeson and it's going to be batted away and hit at with other sticks quite a bit, you'd want a robust edge like this, which is sufficient to deliver very devastating cuts, but it doesn't exactly pop pool noodles apart. Now, I got some good cuts when I was out there cutting pool noodles, water bottles, but I also had a fair amount of them that just batted it away. It, it's worth noting, though, that every cut that I made was effective in the sense that it cut into things and delivered a lot of force, but it wasn't effective at just cleaving a bunch of targets in twain. I did take a honing stone and just go over the, the edge just to, to keen it up a little bit or deburr it maybe, but I didn't really do any kind of sharpening on it. Again, I, I don't have the ability to. It seems like the edge has a profile that could be lightened down. It would take a little bit of work to put a really refined edge like a Naginata has on it, but uh, if it did, then I would imagine it would cut really, really well, because I feel like I can deliver this uh, deliver the edge where I want to very effectively, that my edge alignment is pretty good. It's just that the edge isn't, isn't super sharp. In terms of point control, I feel like I do have a lot of point control when I thrust. I'm more or less getting in the spot that I want to, and it's easy to move around. It doesn't feel like it gets stuck. I did notice when I thrust and then retreat, that back edge is really devastating and just opens the wound channel quite a bit and made, you know, at least the, the devastating cuts on water bottles or thrusts that I did on water bottles turn into some kind of cool cuts, which were fun. The tatami mat, though, was not a great experience. Again, it cut deep enough to really ruin somebody's day, but not like a very clean sword cut. And so uh, these were used Japanese tatami mats. They're harder to cut. This isn't super sharp. It's not a terrible surprise, but every time I was cutting a tatami mat, well, not every time, but the majority of the time, I kind of had like a thud and it, uh, it went into the tatami and the tatami took a lot of, you know, there was a lot of shock that came back. But it's also worth noting that I didn't feel a lot of it. It was still like, I feel like I hit the, the tatami mat, there was a thud, but I wasn't absorbing the shock the weapon was, and I still felt in control and like I could maneuver. So uh, even though it didn't cut cleanly through, it's also worth noting that like, it was still uh, not vibrating me and my hands were uncomfortable to use. I don't know exactly if that's as much a point in and pole arms <laughs> in contrast to swords, but it is worth noting that when you meet a dull thud in a tatami mat, sometimes it can rattle your teeth out of your head and it did not happen in this case. So I kind of skipped ahead to cutting instead of talking about moving it around, but I did try to move it around a little bit like I do in Naginata. Now, the style of martial art that I know that involves Naginata doesn't allow me to show it on camera, but uh, I'm trying to do some maneuvers that are probably going to be similar, but it's not any any kind of official thing. So it's, it's clumsy for me to do that because I can't do the kata that I practice all the time, but I, that those are the only moves I know. So as I'm trying to parse some together in my head unofficially, um, I look confused and awkward, but that's fine. I'm used to it. Anyway, uh, as you see me moving it around, what I can tell you is it's really comfortable. It locks in my hand. I can always find where the edge is. I, I feel like I'm in total control of the weapon at all times. It's really easy to thrust. It's not hard to keep that tip out there either. It's not hard to do kind of warding uh, maneuvers to, to try to gain the center line and, and move the tip around. It's easy to, to move the shaft in that 
end point is just really powerful. It also doesn't snag on me, nothing grabs me, um, and it's it's just a joy to, to move around and, and train with. I, I had a lot of fun trying to do some Naginata stuff, and off camera I worked through my kata and it was just it was really fun to use. I prefer an elliptical non-octagonal shape, but out of all the other pole arms that I currently have in my collection, this is certainly my favorite. Really well-made Naginata. I do still prefer how they move in my hand, but this is uh, robust and feels like it's made for war and sturdy. And I, I certainly have no complaint about how it moved or how I gripped it. It was still very fun to move around. Um, and not uncomfortable. It didn't get in the way of me trying to do the training. And even though this isn't the weapon that I would typically train with, it's a little different. It's similar. It's a sword on a stick. Uh, it just wasn't an obstacle to training. So I could work on all the maneuvers and things that I'm trying to do. And the, the weapon was not getting in the way. It wasn't snagging on me. My fingers weren't getting caught. It wasn't uncomfortable. I didn't lose the edge. You know, everything felt good and effective for the the for what I was trying to do. So if you are doing some sort of historic thing that involves some sort of regimented kata or practice, then this seems like a an effective tool to do that. I, I certainly didn't mind moving it around pretending it was an Aginata. All right, sword friends, you've seen me move it around. You've seen me cut with it. You've seen close-ups of the bits and bobs. Uh, hopefully at this point you have some idea of if it's worth your hard-earned money or not. But uh, to me personally, this is one that I wouldn't necessarily seek out, but I see a lot of value here. It is not something that I've seen on the market before. Admittedly, my understanding of pole arms is different than swords and katanas in particular, but uh, it's not something that I'm familiar with. And so if you're looking for something like this, the fact that there is an option is really cool. Arms and Armor has some kind of obscure things that I haven't seen anyone else do. There's a variety of hooks and bills and other pole arms from medieval times that are, you know, likely well researched and not dissimilar to what you would find in a museum. So uh, that is really cool. And if that's what you're looking for, then it likely adds the value here. But for me, it's it's not. If I was going to spend $1,375 for a sword on a stick, I'd lean more toward a Naginata, uh, and that would likely be the direction that I would go. Um, but that's because that's that's more my bag. However, this is awesome. It is fun to move around. It's exceptionally well made as well. Uh, things that I would want to know more about, uh, you know, I'd love to see that little cross guard attached to the socket and be more robust. I'd like to see the socket enforced in some way that it is going to take more uh, than a few bad cuts on a tummy mat to cause any amount of wiggle. But I really like the, the butt cap at the end. I like the shape of the blade as well. Although I would like, you know, if I were doing it, I want to see it apex just a little bit differently so that it would cut to Tommy mats better and that it would cut pool noodles and the things that I have fun with doing in my backyard. And also, I'd be using it against not people in, in mail. I'd, ima I'd imagine a lot of this is geared toward a historical thing. And if you value that, then there is absolutely something here worthy of your consideration. But if you're looking for fun in your backyard, um, I don't know that it's as much fun for backyard as uh, <laughs> as it would be for a little, little bit. Had a different edge on it in particular. Anyway, uh, it's still a well-made piece. Uh, I certainly can't discredit any of the craftsmanship on here. It seems overall very well well done, and I absolutely had a ton of fun moving it around. It has to say something that it feels really comfortable in your hand. It locks in, and I feel in total control of it, and that is really, even though I'm saying it's not my shtick and, you know, I had some minor complaints about this, that, or the other, the fact that it feels as comfortable in your hand and that you can uh, grab it and, and instantly feel, you know, like you know what to do with it as not quite like it's an extension, but I've had other large weapons like the Albion Maximilian that I was moving around and somebody described that as a dance partner. Uh, and this is not, it feels very much uh, like I know what I'm doing. I hold on to it. It feels connected to my body. I feel like I could put the pointy end where I want it to go. I feel like if I slash, I can be effective with it. I feel like if I want to ward something off, I can do that as well. And that that is amazing. That's fantastic because it doesn't always happen that you pick a weapon up that does that. I, I credit the folks at Arms and Armor for knowing what they're doing uh, to, to give me that feeling in in, uh, in a weapon that is something I've, I've frankly never held before. So anyway, uh, hopefully that's interesting. Thanks to the folks at Arms and Armor for sending it my way. Uh, I hope it provided some value. Cheers, and thanks for watching.